the Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. John Forestier. Hexy, Hexy, you two in Forestier's case. Sure, I saw the coat. It was Dawn Forestier's, that's for sure. Had her name stitched in it. As beautiful a piece of sable as a poor newspaper reporter ever looked upon. Yeah, and her other clothing was there, too. Underneath the coat. Clara, is believed that the beautiful Dawn Forestier has been murdered. This morning, several hours after Dr. Forestier reported his wife missing, Sexton Rolf Griggs of Green Cedar Cemetery found a bundle of clothing inside the cemetery gate, which has been identified as belonging to Mrs. Forestier. Oh, golly, in the burial ground. Hmm. Readers of the Gazette will recall the dramatic circumstances which have surrounded Dawn Forestier since early this year. She was discovered one morning in the spring, wandering in the park near Lawnview Hospital by Dr. John Forestier. Sure, I remember. Read all about it. She was a victim of um, 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 amnesia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that means you can't remember who you are or where you came from or anything. That tells all about it here in the Gazette. The doctor took her to the hospital. Yeah. And he named her Dawn. Uh-huh. And, and fell in love with her and married her. They never discovered who she was. Uh, it says here, it was thought at the time the beautiful woman who later became the bride of Dr. Forestier might have attended a masked ball or came from the stage. But no such person was ever reported missing. Sure. Don't you recall it, Clara? She was dressed in an old-fashioned gown that was torn all to tatters. Yeah, and now she's disappeared again, as mysterious-like as she came. Oh, gee, ain't it awful? You know, Clara, I kind of got it figured out. I'll bet she was the mall of some gangster who spirited her away and murdered her. Gee, murdered. Probably cut into a hundred... Gentlemen of the press, I have called you here to my home to tell you that you need not continue your search for Mrs. Forestier. What do you mean, Doctor, not to continue the search? Well, what's the dope, Dr. Forrester? Have you located her? I think perhaps we have. Well, where, where is she, Doctor? Where did you find her? Uh, please. Uh, what are you going to do? Please, gentlemen. If you will kindly allow me to do the talking, or rather, if you will permit Mrs. Forrester to speak. Well, then she is here in the house? No. My... My wife will speak to you through a letter she left behind for me. I only discovered it this evening. For you see, she had placed it in a volume of verse from which I often read to her. Oddly enough, I had thought I would never want to open the sonnets from the Portuguese again. It was against my will that I turned to it this evening. Perhaps guided by dawn. Who knows? Who can say? It was here I found her letter to me. Well, well, it is in the letter, Dr. Forrestier. I'm about to read it to you. 
There will be a few passages I will omit. They are personal messages meant only for my eyes. But here is the story of the disappearance of Dawn. My darling John, this is going to be the most difficult and tragic hour of my life, for in this letter I must say farewell to you, my devoted husband. The story I have to tell you, John, will be so strange and terrible that at first you won't believe it. But as you remember me, as you recall the circumstances of our meeting, how you found me dazed and wandering in the park one spring morning, how we've never known who I was or where I came from, then you will give more credence to my story. You named me Dawn because you found me at sunrise. Boris, dear, because you loved me. We met in the dawn, my darling. But I must creep away from you in the darkness of the night. Oh, John, how I've loved you. And yet how disturbed I've been since I've lived here with you. I've tried to keep it from you. But your analytical mind and keen eyes have often noted my condition. You've repeatedly said... What is it, Dawn? What's wrong? I... Nothing, darling. Why? You know, dear, I often think it must have been during the night time that you were mistreated or abused by someone or something which brought about your amnesia. Why, John? Because it's always in the night time that you appear nervous, disturbed. Oh. Oh, John, you're imagining things. It was not you, John, who was imagining things. It was I. At least at first I thought it was a product of my imagination. It happened for the first time a few days after we returned from our honeymoon and had come here to live. You had left my room. I had turned off the light by my bed, prepared to sleep. First, I thought I must be dreaming. From a distance... I heard a singing wind, like the opening strains of a melody played on an organ. Something quickened within me. I seemed to know the melody. I thought to myself, everything is going to come back to me. I shall know who I was before I became Dawn Forest here. I listened intently. And then as I was listening... My outer bedroom door seemed to light up. Yes, that's it, to light up. I sat up in bed. A street light shining through my window made the... the thing that materialized against my door. Very discernible. I could see that it was something phosphorescent. It glowed and shimmered in the half-light. Then I could see that it was taking a shape and form. The form of a human being. For many seconds, I looked upon it too frightened to speak. Finally, I got out the words, What are you? There was no answer. When I spoke, it disappeared. In the morning, I was convinced I'd dreamed it all. But the next night, the same thing occurred again. Once more, I was aroused from a half-sleep by the music of the wind. The second time, the glowing figure seemed to be closer. I spoke again. Who are you? This time, the figure didn't vanish so quickly after I'd spoken. It lingered a few seconds and then faded away like a picture on a screen. This materialization occurred for seven consecutive nights. It was then, John, that I asked a favor of you. Remember? John? Yes, darling? Would you think it too bold of me if I asked if we might go away for the weekend? No, darling. I wish we could. I've noticed how nervous you've been the last few days. I'm sorry, dear. I don't know what it is. Don't let it distress you, Dawn. You're not entirely well, you know. Maybe some time before your nerves stop playing tricks on you. You're so helpful to me, John. I wish I might grant your request to go away for the weekend, but my work at present makes it impossible. Oh, it's all right, dear. It was only a suggestion. I'm really all right. So long as I have you. You had said it would be a long time before my nerves stopped playing me tricks. Oh, this was something to cling to. It was silly of me to get upset. No human figure really materialized in my room. It was my nerves playing me tricks. But 
The visitation didn't stop John. Hearing the singing wind, having that glowing, shimmering thing appear in my room was continuous. And then came the thing that struck terror in my heart. This night I had fallen asleep. Again, the music of the wind aroused me. I opened my eyes, and then I gasped in fright. <gasps> For this time, the glowing figure was standing beside my bed, so near me I could reach out and touch it. Then something terrible happened. I found I, I couldn't breathe. Rapidly, You made an appointment for me with Dr. Bland, the eminent psychiatrist. Oh, I know, darling, you were upset because I refused to go to him. But I knew by then that it was no use. The thing was growing bolder all the time. Many nights it stood over me in my room, and without touching me, was yet able to take the breath from me and command it to enter its own body. As it did this, night after night, it became stronger, and I became weaker. You will recall vividly what occurred two weeks ago tonight. We were invited to the Westings for dinner, and we accepted. An hour before we were to leave, I sat at my dressing table, putting the last finishing touches to my makeup. It was only dusk outside. Never had the thing appeared, but in the nighttime, I was brushing my hair when I heard the melody of the wind. figure stood right behind me. And John, I could see what it was. In the mirror, I could see what the thing was. and torments the beautiful Dean Forrester here. Eh? The hermit who knows all the weird and terrible happenings on the earth. The hermit will tell you all before the night is done, yes. <laughs> and now, the hermit. And now, Dr. Forrester continues to read to a group of newsmen the letter his wife, Dawn Forrester, left for him before her strange disappearance. Listen to Dawn Forrester's story of the mystery of the thing. <laughs> this, John, is going to be the difficult part to make you believe. That... As the thing stood behind me at the dressing table, I could tell what it was. We didn't go to the Westings for dinner. Instead, you put me to bed. I shouldn't have allowed you to accept, darling. You haven't been up to par for days. 
I'm going to call Ralph in to see you tomorrow. You don't look well, darling. Don't call anyone in, dear. It'll, it'll do no good. Nonsense, honey. There are very few things that medical science can't cure these days. And believe me, darling, I'm going to have you well again. Your doctor friend came. He gave me medicine to take. Oh, I knew it was no use, no use at all. And yet I would do anything to humor you. For the thing that I now recognized was getting so strong that it was always near me. As I grew weaker, it grew stronger. And I wondered that you couldn't hear it breathing in my room. <laughs> now it had a power over me. A strong, compelling power. It was the master. I, almost a slave. Night before last, it exerted its will for the first time. It compelled me to rise from my bed. It was so strong now, it could actually make sound. Come with me. Come with me. As I rose from the bed, its phosphorescent glow seemed to envelop me. We moved toward the door, and it opened without the touch of a hand. We seemed to glide down the stairs, out of doors. The wind that touched my face was like the refrain I'd heard over and over again. We moved along the street, I and the thing. With great speed, we covered the streets and were soon on the outskirts of the city. <gasps> I could see now the place which was our destination. Then I mastered all the willpower left me, for I understood clearly all the dark things I'd not known before. But, but, John, there was you. I couldn't go to this place where the thing was taking me. I couldn't enter there without somehow leaving word for you. I, I struggled. I, I fought with my adversary. I was gaming. I broke away. Somehow I got breath and strength enough to return home and to my bed. Now comes the end of my story and my farewell to you. Here, gentlemen, I, I will omit a page. It is personal. But what happened to Dawn? Where is she? Since this morning, when the sex in that green cedar burial ground found my wife's clothing, permission has been granted by the state for me to check up on the material found in this letter. I've almost finished reading to you. I'm refraining from reading the last pages until we have made a visit to the cemetery. If you men of the press will get in your cars and follow me, we may be able to complete and verify the information given to me by Don Forestier. Hello, Dr. Forestier. The men have nearly completed digging. Thank you, Sexton. What goes on, Dr. Forestier? As you can see, these men are engaged in opening up a grave. Oh, I want to call Dr. You've come to the casket, Doctor. Very well, Sexton. If you'll please open the box. Yes, sir. Can you lift the casket out, boys? Right. <laughs> now, gentlemen, after the box is opened, I'll read the remainder of my wife's letter. Open it, please, Sexton. Oh, great heaven. Yeah. Dr. Forrest, dear. Great Scott. Why have you opened this grave? Sexton, will you reach in and procure the diamond ring that lies in the coffin? Yes. Here it is, sir. This is my wife's ring, gentlemen. How did it get in this coffin? Here are the last pages of my wife's letter to me. Now comes the end of my story. And my farewell to you. John, I knew from the moment I saw the thing in the mirror of my dressing table. I knew from then on who and what it was. The first night I was strong enough to break away from it as it drew me to the gates of Green Cedar Cemetery. And I've spent my last day writing this letter to you. For tonight, the thing will appear again. And this time, I must follow it. I must follow it to the grave, John. Into the grave. I know how it will be. The thing, the protoplasm that has appeared before me so many nights and has grown in features and strength, 
will absorb me until I'm no longer a living person, and I must follow it. First, I will hear the music of the wind. Then the thing will appear, and I will be dissolved into it. John, my darling, in case you don't believe my story, open the grave near which you will find my discarded clothing. For I'm wearing the ring you gave me, my love. I'm wearing it as I return to the grave. For you see, John, the thing that I saw in the mirror, that which has gained power over me, is I, John. It is my own ghost come to claim me to return to the grave from which I broke away. It is awful, Clara. Could anyone believe such a terrible thing could happen on this earth? Hmm. It's almost too horrible to talk about. Yeah. There, when they opened that grave, lay a decayed skeleton. Oh! Wearing the same satin gown that Dawn Forestier was wearing when she was found wandering in the park by Dr. Forestier. And there was Dawn's ring inside the casket. Yeah. It says here in the Gazette that the inscription on the tombstone over that grave read, Lila Manton. And Lila Manton was a famous actress 85 years ago. She died one night very suddenly, just as she was to appear on the stage. Her cue to appear on stage was an organ playing. The music was written by the man Lila Manton was going to marry that night after the theater play was over. And the name of the man was David Forrestier. He was a relative of Dr. John Forrestier. But she died that night. The marriage never took place. What do you think it means, Clara? Does it mean that Lila Manton returned from the spirit world to live out her life that was ended so suddenly? Sure, I think so. But her ghost body made her come back to the grave. Well, that's how I got it figured out. Forestier was haunted by her own ghost body until it finally absorbed a new vision and shape and made her return to her grave. Yes, turn on your light. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. All characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. <laughs> <laughs>